Hello and welcome to season seven of the Masterclass series in partnership with the Office of the Miami-Dade Mayor. My name is Dan Gretsch, the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and the host of this great Masterclass series. Uh, this topic, season seven, is how to plan for success in 2023. I'm here to tell you that winter is coming. And I don't just mean the nice cool weather in South Florida. And I'm not referring to the White Walkers. I'm talking about a recession. 98% uh, of CEOs say that they are preparing for a recession in 2023, driven by the messed up economic policies of the Biden, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, driven uh, by inflation, uh, a potential two front war in Europe and Asia, uh, supply chain issues from COVID-19 and an incredible series of uh, an incredible influx of cash uh, that's working its way through the economy in response to the COVID-19 epidemic. So we have a lot of factors uh, that are working together to create uh, what could potentially be a very bumpy 2023 for some of us. Now, studies by Bain, uh, McKenzie, uh, Harvard have shown that the companies that weathered the Great Recession of 2008 most effectively had one single thing in common. They were prepared. The goal of these four masterclass sessions is how to plan for success in 2023. I see for my business and for yours, the recession is an opportunity. Because there's that old saying, you see who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. The idea is that if you have tight business processes and a good strategy, and you're ready for the recession that is coming in 2023, you will eat up market share and you will succeed. That's at least the goal of these next four master classes. And I'm so honored to be here um, with this incredible lineup. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the lean startup methodology and how it can apply to your preparation as a small business for the coming recession. We're also gonna talk about red ocean and blue ocean strategy. We're gonna get a case study from an incredible uh, small business that's expanding um, in 2023 and talk about the decision and thought process behind that. And we're gonna also talk about how you can lead your people and prepare for some of the tough decisions you might need to make around personnel, given the economic situation. Next week, we're gonna be talking about EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, written about in the book, Traction. In my circles, I'm part of the Entrepreneurs Organization. This is the hottest strategy framework for small businesses. And I use it for my own business. I'm a huge fan of it. It's the simplified way of doing strategy and it's a great place to start if you're not being super strategic or you're not being really method, um, meth methodical about your meetings and your cadences and your accountability. Highly recommend it. I use it for my own business and I use it in my consulting. We're going to then take a little break for the Thanksgiving holiday and we're going to come back uh, after the, the break with a specific workshop led by a pinnacle coach on how to prepare for the coming recession. He actually is going to walk us through uh, an incredible assessment called the Downturn Readiness Assessment. I just finished doing it for my own business. I identified three areas that I need to work on between now and the end of the year. And I feel like I'm ready, uh, in part because of this assessment, uh, for what's to come. And then finally, when you're in a moment of challenge, the tendency is to turtle and to stop communicating. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. And so Jennifer Hudson is going to talk about how to communicate during a downturn, uh, both to your part potential prospects from a marketing perspective, but also to your customers, your investors, your staff, and all the stakeholders who matter. So building a communication strategy has never been more important than when there are bumpy waters ahead. That is what we have to come. I'm very excited to kick off season seven of the Masterclass series today with building a business the lean startup way. Uh, I'll introduce you to these four incredible panelists in a minute. First, I wanna invite my amazing partner, Danilo Vargas, 
brother from another mother from the office of the mayor and the Stride 305 uh, program. Danilo, welcome and thank you again. I want you to know that this is provided as a free service to our community because of the mayor and her dedication to small businesses in South Florida. Well, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you to everybody who's joining us today on this master master class today. Um, season six, by the way, was phenomenal. I learned so much about Web3 and the metaverse and how these things are just uh, beyond theory and can be something that we can use in our day to day running of our business to even increase our market share. So mind blowing stuff. I encourage everybody to please check out the um, the replays on YouTube at the BizHack channel on YouTube. Uh, but now our focus turns to 2023, because as Dan mentioned, the economic conditions are challenging to say the least. Um, we are probably headed towards a recession. Um, just today, the Fed may announce another 75 basis point increase in the uh, interest rates. And um, also, you know, COVID taught us that we don't know what curveballs may be ahead. And so given all of that, and no matter what happens, uh, the mayor of Miami-Dade County, Daniel Levin Cava, wants to make sure that our small business owners are prepared and are proactive. And she's continued to invest in Stripe 305, which is our initiative to help support our small business owners come what may. So we know that times may get challenging, but in, in those kinds of moments, as Dan mentioned, there's an opportunity not to stop marketing, but to become a better brander and a better um, marketer in your small business so you can gobble up that market share. Um, that's a great opportunity. So I think that these classes, I'm really excited about them because we're going to talk about strategy and how to make that happen so you can keep striving and thriving in 305 in 2023. So with that, thank you all so much. As always, Dan, I'm ready to take a bunch of notes. I always learn a ton from these classes. So I thank you and your team and all our guests for, for making that happen. We have, we have the most amazing partner in you, Danilo, and just the most amazing guests. Uh, I can't wait to introduce them. You're going to get excited when you hear about the kind of panelists we've been able to bring together. Uh, I also wanted to thank our media sponsor, South Florida PBS. I spent more than a decade of my career at NPR and PBS. I'm very honored uh, that South Florida PBS, PBS2, and the Health Channel uh, are our sponsors for today. And we are the beneficiary. Uh, many of you are here through our promotional partners, our community partners uh, who have shared with us uh, all about their, um, sh shared with their communities all about our masterclass series. I, I wanted to give a quick shout out uh, to my friends at the Entrepreneurs Organization of South Florida, the largest chapter in the East Coast and one of the largest in the world. Thank you for allowing me to promote this on that channel as well. I also wanna mention that there is an NFT conference uh, hosted by Manatech coming up at the end of the month of uh, November. So uh, it's uh, NFT BZL. I uh, hope you guys consider going there. Uh, I am a business storyteller. That is my background, 20 years as a journalist and now 10 years as a marketer, digital marketer, educator, and entrepreneur. Uh, and um, this kind of work, hosting, uh, amazing guest reminds me a lot of the work I used to do when I started Miami's first podcast, Under the Sun. So it really feels like coming home to be here with you today. We always get the same questions. So I want to make sure you all listen just for this little bit, because we're going to, I guarantee you, one of you is going to ask. You will get a follow up email with a link to a recording of this session. You'll get a follow up email with a link to this recording. So don't feel like you have to take notes. Don't worry if your partner couldn't make it. Don't worry you have to leave early. This will be posted for free on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. And if there are any handouts or additional resources that are provided by our speakers, we'll provide those too in the follow-up. We will also automatically register, your, register you for upcoming masterclasses. So you will be getting automated reminders for the upcoming masterclasses, not only the three that come in this season, but the 11 others that are happening between now and September after in 2023. And we're also going to give you information. We offer a scholarship program for BIPOC and women-owned businesses. Uh, we have funded more than 150 BIPOC and women-owned businesses at the tune of more than $300,000. Um, I know uh, I'm a big white guy, but I'm also the son of an immigrant from Spain, and uh, I'm very honored uh, to be able to serve and, and to um, recognize and to elevate uh, underserved businesses with that scholarship program. 
So let's get to it. Building a business the lean startup way. What's the lean startup way? You'll learn that today. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with doing quick uh, introductions uh, of the, we're going to start with Mike. Uh, Mike, you'll then present, uh, and then we'll, I'll introduce Yenvi, and then I'll introduce Nadej, and then I'll introduce Terry. So I'm going to do it kind of one at a time. Um, these are Mike's bio points, but I like to uh, do what I call a sentimental introduction, which is I have deep and long lasting relationships with everyone here on the panel. And, and I want to start by saying, you know, Mike O'Donnell has probably been uh, the single most important mentor to BizHack in its five years. Uh, Mike has uh, an incredible clear eye uh, on how to cut through the noise and see your strategy, the skeleton of your strategy with clarity. And it's no accident that in addition to being a buyer and seller of businesses, a business broker at startupbiz.com, in addition to having run, uh, built, and sold his own businesses, Mike is also one of the lead instructors of the Broward, the BCEX, Broward College Entrepreneur Experience Program, which I haven't graduated for the program, so I feel I can say this, is in my, for my money, the best startup program in South Florida. And there's a lot of really good competition out there, including the Goldman Sachs program, but I love BCEX and the way you approach it. It's rigorous and it's really, really good. And they teach the lean startup methodology that Mike is about to introduce. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mike and he's gonna talk about the fundamentals of lean startup. You're on mute. See. Okay. <laughs> can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, Dan, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Really much appreciated. Thanks all for being here today. I'm going to move very quickly because I want to be able to convey the most important concepts of the uh, Lean Startup methodology, why you should be deploying it if you're not already, and, and how you can use it. So, in summary, Lean Startup is a methodology for launching, for building and launching a new product or taking your existing product or service, polishing it up and perhaps pivoting into a new market. And more importantly, rarely taught, rarely talked about, the Lean Startup methodology can be used to actually build the business itself. So the process of, of building a product, launching a product is much different than than building a business. And you can use Lean Startup. I've used it for more than 20 years in my own startups, raised tens of millions of dollars in venture capital with it, often just on a PowerPoint, but, but with the principles that I'm gonna convey. So let's talk about the core principle of, of, of how this methodology works. Every business can be measured on five core dimensions, or I like to think of them as pillars product, market, team, strategy, and economics. Each one of these pillars is comprised of various attributes. And with the Lean Startup methodology, you can examine these attributes and you can actually score them on a, on a scale of one to 10. With one or two being, mm, company's not doing really good on that attribute, or 10, not getting it out of the park. So let's, let's take a quick look at these attributes and how you would apply some of the attributes and how you would apply the Lean Startup methodology. So the first one is product. By applying Lean Startup methodology, you will learn how remarkable is this product. Most products at first are me too, or they're slightly better, slightly cheaper, slightly faster, maybe a little bit of a competitive edge, but not remarkable. You want to build a remarkable product and, and, and not what you think is, because every founder thinks their product is remarkable. Every idea I've ever had was brilliant, right? But then it's not until you get out and engage with the market full time, engage with customers one on one, do hundreds of interviews, do you really learn whether your product is remarkable or what it's going to take to make it remarkable? In Silicon Valley, they call this the 10x rule. They like to write checks to companies that are 10 times better than others in the space or have the potential of being 10 times better if they can execute on the strategy that they learn on, on, on the features 
and on the opportunity that they learn by talking to the customer. So that's product. Second is market. Lean startup methodology will inform how, how to size this market. How, how big is it really? How is it segmented? Most importantly, which segment are you going to target? So many companies fail because they develop a product and they propel it into the wrong market or at the, the wrong time. So understanding the, the size of the market, how it's segmented and, and how you're going to, which market you're going to target first is critical. And that's what you get through the lean startup. Also, you want to be, of course, you want to find out that it's a, it's a growing market and one that you can capture an appreciable share of. The next is team. That's pretty obvious. That's you. That's your folks. Team is about depth and breadth of experience in the space that you're going to compete in. And even if you're not an expert in the space, you're going to make yourself an expert. What it's going to take to get to be an expert. What talent is needed to uh, surround yourself with to be able to execute on the opportunity. Next is strategy. I know Yenvi and, and, um, and Dan talked a lot about strategy. To me, this is the magic. Strategy is what, what determines whether the business is going to be successful or not in the end. It is the ingenuity, the creativity, the planning through which the vision is going to be executed. I have seen this happen so many times, guys. The product is remarkable. On a scale of one to 10, it's an 11. It's got, it's got competitive advantages. It's got barriers to entry. It's got patents. It's a great product. They're targeting the right market. They've done the research. The market's big. It's growing. They can capture an appreciable share. They have a good team. Often the folks that started the company come from that industry because they saw an opportunity. So they really know the space. They know the, the competition. And then they get to the strategy. And they have none. They have no strategy. Or they have the wrong strategy or a poorly formed strategy or a strategy they're not articulating. Or worse, they have the strategy of the week. Block a lot of startups and you know th throw up on the wall and see what sticks. And so they end up failing. They end up burning, they, you know, they're finger pointing and they're churning. And you look at them two or three years later and you go, how could those guys have burned through millions of dollars and nothing to show for it? And almost always it comes down to bad strategy and or the wrong team, but often it's strategy. Conversely, I've seen companies that had a pretty good product, not yet remarkable, could be through the lean startup methodology, finding out what it's going to take to be remarkable. They had a pretty good idea who their target market was, and they're still doing testing. The team is young. It's not yet well rounded out, but they're determined. They're lifelong learners. They're smart that their strategy, brilliant. Knock it out of the park. They take off like a rocket ship and begin backfilling everything else. So it works elsewhere. So strategy is the pivotal, pivotal pillar in, 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 in the lean startup methodology. And finally, you have economics. Economics is money, right? It's how much capital is going to be required and over what period of time to execute on this opportunity to build this business. And what is the return on investment? What is the ROI likely to be? And the most important element of a, a business that has good economics is the extent to which it creates new wealth. Lots of companies are thrashing about in a small marketplace that's not creating new wealth. There's a pie. The pie's not getting any bigger. There's, there's a one or two companies that have big slices, and then there's a bunch of medium slice people, companies that have medium slices. There's lots of little slices, and then there are the scraps, and the startups are all scrounging around for the scraps. The pie's not growing. The economics of a really good business, which will be informed through lean startup methodology, is creating new wealth. It's creating new wealth for the founders, new wealth for its employees, new wealth for its investors, which is why VCs write checks, new wealth, not scrounging around for or, or sharing existing wealth. And it even can create new wealth for the customers, for its customers. So those, those are the dimensions of the pillars, product market strategy, product market team strategy, and economics. Lean startup methodology, if correctly applied, allows you to, to, in, to, to investigate, to discover, and to determine how good a business is in, on each of those dimensions. So that's, that's pretty much 
why it's so important. And you can see these, um, these fundamentals, uh, they're fairly self-explanatory. I've raised money on prototypes, then prototype used that money to, to build the MVP. And then after the MVP raised, raised the bigger, bigger money. So I'll, I guess I'll stop there. I don't know if anybody has questions or. Yeah. So, so one of the things uh, that's at the core of the lean startup methodology, um, and I wanted to just share actually a quick personal anecdote. So there's a book that is a great book about this approach written by Eric Reese called The Lean Startup. What's really cool about this is the first company I worked for out of college was founded by Eric Reese. And it's interesting because he talks about that company in the introduction as the disaster of a company that proved to him he needed to find a better way. So I really uh, kind of appreciate the lean startup approach, but I just was on the before uh, of it. The lean startup methodology comes out of Toyota and lean manufacturing, and it was really pioneered by a guy named Steve Blank. He called it the wonky name customer development, but at the core of it was the interviewing of your potential customer. Could you just talk really quickly about that interviewing process and the um, confirmation bias that sometimes sneaks in uh, when entrepreneurs don't listen? Yeah, two, two, two big traps in, in, in that phase. One is um, asking leading questions for looking for a pre gone conclusion and, and also confirmation bias, just, just hearing what, what it is you want to hear. And I'll give you a quick case study. So I launched a company called iCopyright early 2000s. It was a way of licensing content on the internet. Instant, we had a premise for that the market needed this and how we would build it. We thought it was wonderful. We, we walked up a PowerPoint present. We didn't actually build it. We built it in PowerPoint. This is what it would look like. You would click here and this would happen. You would click here and that would happen. So it was a, it was a mock-up. And so we took it to the International Publishers Association and met with over a hundred publishers. There were thousands there, newspaper, magazine, publishers, broadcasters. That's the big conference, right? We went there, scrounged up enough money to get a little booth talked to people, got people for coffee, wherever we could grab them and just kind of showed them, you know, would, does this look, is this something that would be valuable to you? What would make it more valuable? Um, would you pay for it? How much would you pay for it? Through that process, we changed dramatically the scope of the product. We were gonna build something that turns out would not have been the, the exact right fit. So the more customers you talk to, the better. Once we got the validation and once we tweaked the PowerPoint, we took that to investors and on that PowerPoint raised $600,000. That allowed us to build the MVP. Then we launched it with just one customer, just to test it, just to refine it. And through that process, learned some more and we were able to raise $30 million. So that's the, it, it has to be driven by customers. Otherwise you're gonna miss the mark. What you think are the best features and what the customers think are the best features probably different thing, how they would price it, how they value it is differently. And what you're looking for is the remarkableness, right? How, how much more remarkable can you make it for them? I hope that answered the question, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Yenvi, you're up next. So one of the things we talk about in marketing is there's this great video of The Rock. You guys all know The Rock, right? Uh, Dwayne Johnson. And uh, you might not know this, but before he was sort of a hunky movie star, he was a hunky professional wrestler, you know, the fake wrestling, Hulk Hogan. Anyway, he would used to do this little shtick. Uh, he was such a brilliant talker and he would uh, take the microphone and he would give it to his opponent and let his opponent start talking. And then the opponent got maybe three words out and he would slap the, the microphone out of his hand and he would say, it doesn't matter what you think. And I play this during my marketing classes because it really doesn't matter what you think. It matters what your audience tells you. That's agile. That's lean. And that's what Mike's talking about here. It's not just about marketing, right? Marketing, it doesn't matter what you think works. It matters what your audience responds to. It's also about product and service development. And if you really are thinking, I always say, like, always have the rock sitting in your ear, screaming in your ear, it doesn't matter what you think, you're going to be much more likely to, to, to succeed. And then there's a systematic approach on how to do that, that Mike and his fellow uh, teachers 
uh, including Terry O'Donnell, who's here, uh, Ter Terry Bentley, I should say, uh, where they teach you that in the BCX program. Um, I want to introduce now uh, Yenvi. Yenvi has uh, an extraordinary background uh, as a uh, entrepreneur and as a coach of entrepreneurs. She's also the head of the Scale Up, uh, lead instructor of the Scale Up program at the Idea Center at Miami Dade College. BizHack got its start at the Idea Center years ago. We were called Market Hack. We were a program there. And then five years ago, I spun off and, and here I am. So I'm very grateful to Miami Dade College and to the Idea Center. And uh, I'm also one of the instructors in the startup program. Yenvi, thank you so much for inviting me to do that. She is part, uh, she's the head of Upswing Health, and she can talk a little bit more about that. And she's also here to talk about another way of thinking about strategy called the Red Ocean, Blue Ocean strategy. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Yenvi, and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Dan, and thank you everyone for, for attending today. And um, just the fact that you're here today means that uh, you do care about your business and you want it to grow, especially over the next, um, I would say, 12 to 18 months when it's going to be a bumpy ride. And when we look at companies, there's two paths that a company can take as, a, as an entrepreneur. You can be that moonshot company, right, with this amazing idea of how you're going to get to Mars or you know, tap into meteorites and asteroids and get elements from it for, for the mark, uh, for, for um, the world. But, you know, our economy is made up of small businesses and, and uh, it's the small businesses that really drive our economy, our community and how we survive on a day to day basis. And this, uh, this looming idea of a recession that's coming, um, you know, we, we want to think about it because as, as uh, a CEO of a, a startup, um, right now I've been in, um, I had a technology startup before I had an opportunity to exit and then I, I took on another startup and I just raised capital and there's a different mindset and mentality of, of what, what worries me as a CEO of this startup and this technology company is the fact that raising capital is going to dry up over the next, you know, 12 months when I have to go out and raise more funds for my company. But as a small business owner in our community, there's other worries and, and concerns that we have to focus on. And so when I think about, you know, what, what's going to happen over the next 12 months to 18 months, I said to myself, well, what does, what do the small business owners have to think about that um, that's going to allow them to grow over the next 12 to 18 months and allow them to scale? And that's what, you know, scale up is about. Um, it's, it's allowing the, our entrepreneurs or our small business owners to think about, you know, all the key fundamental pieces that, that they, they need to focus on. And then um, as a BMT mentor, we, we focus, we work with small businesses and also the moonshot entrepreneurs as well. Um, but what I want to talk about today is the red ocean strategy and blue ocean strategy. And this is really, really important because we always think that as a small business owner, this is what you do. You look at a, a restaurant, let's say a Cuban restaurant, and then you're like, that's what they offer, right? You look at a bakery shop and you think, okay, that's what they offer. You look at, you know, a coffee shop and it's the same coffee shop. Okay. I'm going to offer coffee, but it's the way we look at our market, right? So when we're when we build a, a business, whether it's a moonshot business or if it's a, a startup, a technology startup, it, it's always customer centric. And you know, you have one customer, you have two customers, or you have a you know a hundred thousand customers in an area. That's your market, right? And so we want to think about the market itself and how we're relevant to that market. And what the red ocean and blue ocean strategy is about is how do you deliver your products and services in a, in a way to another type of market? So imagine you're selling skincare products and uh, you're, you know, lotions and conditioner, uh, lotions or skincare, you know, uh, retinol and all this stuff. What would you sell it as? You know, a, a normal market would be beauty products for your skin. Right? But when we think about blue ocean strategy, we say, well, it's, um, it's beauty products for women with eczema and sensitive skin. Now we've just kind of carved out a smaller area of the market that's very relevant to a certain type of, uh, of uh, customer. And so just picture this. Now imagine you're in, we call it red ocean. So imagine that 
the red ocean is just full of sharks. Those are your competitors. Everybody's just going at eating all the fish in the ocean. Those are your customers. It's just red because it's been eaten up. It's so competitive. It's so demanding. And you can't differentiate yourself in it. You go in there and all the fish, your customers are being eaten up and taken away. How do you compete with that? How do you go get away from that red ocean, that bloodbath that's happening right now with your competitors? And that's how we look at it when we're a small business is that we're a print shop, we're a coffee shop, we're a restaurant, you know, and we look to our neighbors and then there's another one down the street. There's another one, you know, we're competing with Starbucks. So what do we do? We carve out what we call a blue ocean. We make our own market. We, it's, it's kind of like looking at Dunkin' Donuts and then now you have Salty Donuts. You see how Salty Donuts, they part out their own gourmet um, donuts with all types of toppings and look how successful they are, right? I use that as an example because that's exactly what a blue ocean strategy does is they created their own market. People who really value the toppings and this other type of dessert, not necessarily a donut, not a donut market, but a, 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 you know, maybe extravagant type of donut. And so they call it differently and they look at it differently. They look at their products differently and they, they, they found um, a customer base that loves that type of donut and product. And so when we go into a blue ocean, we don't have any competitors. We think about it critically, how do we make this? And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, over the top and large and extravagant and in your face. It could be just a small change, a two millimeter shift in how we describe our product, how we describe our services, how we describe who our customers are. And, and there, that two millimeter shift of how we, we identify our customer, there could be within your community, within your five or mile radius, there could be a thousand, 10,000 customers that are just right for you, right? And that's, as a small business owner, that loyalty in, in that right customer, they keep coming back to you because they found the right company and the right business that offers exactly what they want. And that's your role as a, a small business, especially maneuvering through the next um, 18 months or so that, that, you know, maybe the recession doesn't come, but just the news about the recession gives us enough anxiety and stress and causes everybody, right. you know, to, to go through it. But how do we dis differentiate ourselves with just a two millimeter shift, just by looking at our, our product and services differently. And so yeah. um, that's really what a blue ocean and red ocean strategy is. I love it. And um, we're going to see actually an example with Nadej Sterling in a minute uh, on a, what I think is kind of a blue ocean, red ocean shift, uh, which is the, the B2C uh, bakery that opens a B2B uh, arm of its business. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a sec, but I actually wanted to share a personal reflection on this that combines the two methodologies in, in a very personal way in the way BizHack has operated over the last five years. So I have had a thousand businesses run through our training program, the paid training program. And every single one of them I've spoken to is part of an application process. And as best I could, I tried to take a customer development, uh, listen with curiosity, journalistic approach to those conversations. And what I came to learn after a thousand conversations was that my, I lacked a product market fit. And it was like the most painful thing in the world. But I realized that most business owners don't want to be trained in digital marketing. They just want someone to do the marketing for them. And so all of my mentors were like, Dan, just start an agency. But for personal reasons, I didn't want to run an agency. I've worked at an agency. It's not good for life, family life balance. You know, I don't like someone owning my time like that. And so I, I knew I didn't have a product market fit. And I knew what the problem they really wanted me to solve was, which is that they don't have a marketing strategy and they want someone to make it for them and then figure out the people to do the strategy. And that's when I bumped into, and this is through coaching from people like Mike O'Donnell, this other approach, which is called the fractional chief marketing officer. It's a part-time outsourced head of marketing, just like we all are used to doing with lawyers or HR 
or even technology, right? So it's not a new concept, although it's relatively new to marketing. And that was my shift from red, which is filled with competitors, you know, the Russell Brunsons and HubSpots and Facebooks and Googles all pedal in digital marketing training. I mean, there's no way I'm going to beat the best marketers in the world, the largest companies in the world at their own game. Impossible. The reddest of red oceans. And now I'm in a blue ocean where there actually are not that many fractional CMO companies. In fact, I have 50 certified instructors. Now they're 50 certified fractional CMOs. And I have half as many as my leading competitor, Chief Outsiders, which has 100 overnight. And now I'm in a blue ocean and the sky's the limit. So anyway, let's introduce now the next uh, amazing panelist, which is Nadej. Um, I had uh, the, the pleasure uh, of working with Nadej uh, a little bit uh, and basically just came away thinking uh, this is a brilliant business owner uh, who uh, I'm very lucky to know. Uh, Nadej uh, has worked at some of the largest brands in the world, like PepsiCo, uh, Frito-Lay, and now she's applying those corporate best practices to her family-owned, um, is it LePay Bakery? Yes, perfectly said, LePay. Oh, great. Working on my Creole. Uh, LePay Bakery, um, which is a family-run, family-owned uh, bakery that Nadej is now just taken to the next level, including opening up a, a brand new location. So Nadej, uh, you also have an incredible background of volunteerism uh, and activism, but uh, today we're really here to talk uh, about a case study, a case study of shifting, I think, from a red ocean to a blue ocean. So uh, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you for the introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadeed Sterling. I am co-owner and co-founder of La Pet Bakery. Uh, La Pet means the peace in French, and, and we are a Caribbean bakery specializing in Haitian baked goods, pastries, sweets, and beverages. Um, you know, as a small business, our single operating storefront is actually located in Miramar, Florida. That's in Broward County. Um, but to Dan's point earlier, we have both a B2C and a B2B model um, by servicing customers directly through our storefront and by delivering to local grocery chains. Um, the bulk of our business revenue currently comes from B2C, um, but we're looking at growing our B2B business in the near future. Um, La Pelle launched in 2005. Um, however, you know, being in that COVID pandemic environment really drove us to innovate in a major way. Uh, we had to become agile and we had to shift our thinking similar to a startup company, even though we've been open since 2005. Um, so late 2020, um, I believe that's when we started to revamp our business. Um, we did a lot of branding work, um, expanded our menu options. We completed a front of the house renovation. Um, and with that pandemic environment settling in, we really leaned into creating an environment that was aesthetically pleasing to consumers. We wanted consumers and customers to walk in and feel like they were back home if they were in Haiti. We wanted them to feel like they were walking into their mother's kitchen, you know, something that they can identify with. Um, so definitely the aesthetics of the location, um, quality control uh, was a big focus. And we had a hyper focus on efficiency. Um, within that time frame as well. All of this work, if you can see towards the middle of the slide, all the work and the execution of our new strategy led us to 60, almost 68% um, sales revenue growth in, two, in 2020 versus 2019. Um, last year, we actually doubled our business. Um, and this year, we continue to see strong double digit growth at plus 40%. And this is all sales revenue. Um, we had to double our staff headcount, but we're glad we were able to expand our team to keep up with the demand. Um, and we also, again, we grew our hot meal category, which was out of the five categories, hot meals is now our third um, category and it's growing the fastest. Next slide, please. 
all of the sustainable growth and profit trends, uh, along with some other key considerations, drove us to decide to open our second location in Miami-Dade. Uh, the tentative timing is next year, 2023, uh, but with this second location, it's actually triple the size of our current location. Um, and it would help uh, maintain both our retail and our manufacturing hybrid model. We make our product from scratch, bread from scratch, pastries from scratch and wanna maintain that. Um, but we also wanna take advantage of new opportunity unlocks. Um, where we are currently, we're at capacity. I could say we are definitely at capacity um, and we're being driven uh, to really launch a domestic shipment um, uh, support model, uh, expand our grocery deliveries. We currently deliver to Presidentes, price choices, food fairs, and we want to be able to expand that and support uh, the broader market. Um, we're looking at placing federal contract bids. Uh, we have signed up on SAMS. Um, and we're currently uh, looking at proofing our model location with this new Miami Dade location to eventually launch franchise opportunities. Um, we've been approached within the last year and a half, I would say about uh, three to four times already for franchise opportunities. So that's something uh, that's pulling us in that direction to um, consider and open up. Um, but our current Broward County location is takeout. Um, but indeed, uh, with this expanded location, uh, we're also going to offer limited in and outdoor seating as well. Uh, so definitely a, a shift for our whole team um, and our vision for where we can take a La Pet Bakery. You know, as a team, we're really excited to see how our vision evolves. Um, and really at this time, Dan, you know, and others, feel free to let me know if there are any questions, uh, but welcome again to La Fe Bakery. I love it. You know, there's a little bit of a, first of all, wow. <laughs> Look at these growth numbers. I mean, you know, it's not all about growth, but what this is actually a reflection of is just doing all the right things, you know, taking, kind of a family run bakery that was run in a certain way and the next generation coming in and sprucing up the menu, sprucing up the physical location. This is the same retail space, right? This is this, actually the year before in 2018, we, uh, we downgraded. We went from two suites to one. And we really wish we had maintained that other location because then it would have helped build capacity. So business was not doing well before, yeah. even before the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, you, you are a very special person. Uh, I've worked very closely with you. You're among the most studious and hardworking people I've ever met. And your study of business and your careful um, willing, your deep willingness to invest in your own learning has allowed you to do this. This is not an accident. This is, this is like the great, you know, are your parents uh, immigrants? Yes. And are you a first generation? I'm a first generation. Yeah, yes. as a fellow first generation immigrant with a father from Spain, this is a true great American entrepreneurship story and I'm so excited to be sharing this. I wonder, <clears throat> do, you, um, do you look at like Pinecrest Bakery and the success they've had um, as a potential model for La Paix? Uh, as a quick background, Pinecrest Bakery uh, is more of a Cuban, uh, so it's another kind of Caribbean style bakery. And I wonder if that that is a model, a potential uh, competitor. How do how do you uh, look at Pinecrest? Well, that that's a great question. I will say I'm not familiar with Pinecrest necessarily, but I am familiar with Miramar Bakery, Vicky's Bakery, um, even take a step back and even Panera, Starbucks. Why couldn't I, you know, use those as a learning, you know, a learning opportunity or a vision um, for our bakery? And so I try to stretch not only my thinking in terms of how big, you know, this chain could be, but also our, our entire kind of board um, and staff in terms of where it can go. Um, yeah. At this time, you know, unfortunately, I haven't seen a, a Haitian bakery specifically within that niche that has scaled domestically to where it could be. So that's that's a blue ocean <laughs> in terms of the learnings, there's an opportunity to, to really uh, you know, expand and think about how can we scale and bring these type of products um, 
uh, domestically and of course internationally eventually as well. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's an incredible um, story. Uh, and do you know Pilar Guzman Savala of Half Moon Empanadas? Yes, I do. Yeah. So to me, Pinecrest Bakery and Half Moon Empanadas are beautiful examples of potential local models. I call them aspirational competitors, like people I'd like to be like when I grow up. Um, I mean, Pilar, uh, anyone who's ever heard or met Pilar Guzman, you know, because she is all over the like all-star entrepreneur speaking circuit uh, is inspired by their story. But, you know, you know, they've kind of made it when, you know, you find um, Half Moon a at the airport, uh, when you find, uh, uh, you know, Pinecrest Bakery is embedded inside of FIU's main campus. So, um, yeah, I think two beautiful models of, of what you're doing. And I absolutely, you know, even, you know, Le Pen Quotidien and, uh, you know, just the idea of a French bakery. What, what's so exciting is uh, French Creole, you know, a, a, a Haitian bakery. It's, it's, it, I, I think this, this, this is very much um, the Red Ocean is Miami. The blue ocean is everywhere yes. but Miami. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? So, so, so as you, the red ocean is being a bakery in Miramar that's B2C. The blue ocean is a B2C, a B2B that can, tra that can tra you know, travel your bread from Naples to Key West to Palm Beach. And you need a commercial kitchen with that size. One of the things a lot of our clients like you are doing are what are known as ghost kitchens. So a kitchen that serves a storefront is a kit is a commercial kitchen. A kitchen that serves a food truck or a online ordering or a B two B kind of business is more of a ghost kitchen. And what we're seeing a lot of our, our restaurant clients and our, our our bakery clients do is take you know a, a chunk of their kitchen capacity and dedicate it to what's known as a ghost kitchen opportunity. Have you thought about? Uh, or do you, the ghost kitchen opportunity as well as you move into the new space? That's that's definitely something that we thought about. And Dan, <laughs> with your mentorship, of course, that's something that we, that we've thought about for for the near future as well. Wonderful. All right. Well, I want to welcome now up um, our our fourth and certainly not, uh, fourth fine, um, panelist, um, which is um, Terry Ann Brown. Terry Ann is. Um, uh, another kind of dear uh, friend and mentor. Um, she is the um, the head of community partnerships at the venture mentoring team. The venture mentoring team has been such an important part of BizHack's growth. Um, before I even had started my business, I applied to and was accepted as a mentee of the venture mentoring team. And I basically got a board of advisors of brilliant former or current CEOs. You're seeing the kind of quality uh, of the folks in the venture mentoring team. Mike, Yenvi, and Terry are all mentors in that venture mentoring team. Um, and many of the people who are here as participants as well uh, were incredible venture mentors to me. And what you get out of the venture mentoring team um, is access to the kind of advice that simply uh, can't be paid for. Um, these are disinterested folks who are volunteering their time to help you. And um, I also want to give a shout out to Terry Bentley, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the venture mentoring team and is here today supporting his colleagues. Um, Terry uh, is here to talk about um, people. One of the challenges that we need to get ready for is personnel changes as the downturn comes. So, Terry, could you talk a little bit about how, as an HR expert, uh, how you can how business owners can start thinking about the challenge to come with personnel? Sure. Thank you, and welcome everybody. And um, I'm lucky that I get to go after everyone because I'm stealing little nuggets uh, from everyone as they're as they're speaking. And I think a few of the principles that I would apply to going into a recession as a, as a business owner um, from Mike and Yenvi uh, and even Nadej, as everybody was talking uh, that I would put together 
is number one, as you plan and prepare and take a look at how your business is currently doing, it's really important to take a look at what are those key performance indicators that lets you know um, how you should prepare to first and foremost communicate externally with your clients, whether it's your customers uh, that may be walking in through the door, or if, if you're B2B, like maybe Nadege is, talk with your clients about some things that they may be facing and start to manage the expectations of those external facing um, key stakeholders that are in your business. Um, you may want to have start having those conversations now about what are some things that they may be anticipating in terms of uh, it, could they potentially have uh, cash flow issues where they may end up having to pay you later and start to negotiate those things. Once you have a really great idea of what are some of those key performance indicators that could have potentially affect your cash flow, then you can start to have those internal conversations with your employees and be open and honest with them um, that says, hey, this is where we are currently. Uh, these are what our clients are telling us. And another great reason, and this is the blue ocean strategy that Yenvi was talking about, to have some of those internal um, conversations with your with your employees is then you can start to uh, maintain that relationship with those customers that are coming in. What's going to differentiate you and how you treat those customers? What's going to differentiate you and how you um, add a little bit extra in customer service? Add a, little, add a little bit extra in how you make that customer feel special during these down times that lets them know, hey, uh, we may not be able to do anything financially or monetarily for you, but when you come in, we've heard you, we've listened to you, and now we're going to turn that into a way that when you come in and receive services from us, you're going to know that you're getting something really special with us. And then the other part of this is we know that there could potentially be some tough conversations that you're going to have with your employees. Maybe you hired um, a lot because you were having some great profitable times, but now you're maybe going to have to do some uh, re retraction and, and maybe do some layoffs. So going back to Mike's point of asking in the lean startup me methodology, how remarkable is this? How remarkable is this employee compared to what are the responsibilities that I need in this key moment? And I, I also want you to think about what is your role as the founder and the CEO? Your role is to obviously keep the doors open, keep the revenue coming in. And I want you to consciously think about uh, not getting too far into the weeds that you then also have to become the person doing everything. Still take a look at those employees that you can um, Think about once again how remarkable are they how can i still tap into this these employees skill set and uh, keep that employee engagement going on and if you do have to make a really tough decision to let somebody go how can i do that as humanely as possible so that's when you tap into the community resources and find out what are the resources available that i can share with this employee about hey i'm sorry that i can no longer afford to keep you on but here's a resource that you can go to to find um, available support for your family or unemployment or whatever it may be and in addition to the community resources and i know that we're going to talk about this a little bit later dan another key component of it and this is to nadege nadege's point there are plenty of millionaires and businesses that can succeed during an economic downturn. Um, and that's what Nadege was able to do during uh, the COVID pandemic. And that's how I actually met her is through a program called Elevate Together. That's a corporate initiative with Office Depot. Uh, they were giving out grants to black and Hispanic owned uh, women or black and Hispanic owned small businesses, $5,000, $10,000 grants through the National Urban League, through the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So tap into those community resources that are potentially available that meet your, um, meet your criteria, your demographics, whatever it is. There are plenty available that pop up during that time. So please make sure that you're tapping into those as well, not only for your business, but also for your employees. So it's, it's a great opportunity for you to be savvy, but also um, another thing that I stress is sometimes as small business owners, we are so busy working in the business. It's also a great time to take a step back and work on the business. I call it self-care for your business. 
take, take that time, step back, plan, strategize, but most importantly, think about your communication plan. I know that Jennifer Hudson's gonna do a session on that later, uh, but just think about how you can communicate effectively both externally and internally. So that's what I got for you. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, we're gonna go a little long today so that we can actually allow each of the panelists to talk about their respective programs that they're part of. Um, and, but before we get to that, I wanted to address Jonathan Oliveira's question. And um, he said, so what if I'm just starting my business and have no employees, what should I do? Um, that's a great question. I'll give it to Mike. Uh, and then uh, Yen B and Terry Ann, feel free to pipe in after that. Outsource. <laughs> you, you need, you're going to need some talent, some resources. And I've started a lot of companies by having zero employees and didn't even employ myself. Um, and um, can often get good people to um, do work with you on a barter basis or for deferred equity, deferred income or, or equity. And I built a couple of companies early in my, in my career that um, uh, every, everybody was doing it for sweat equity until we hit a point where we could pay everybody and then made it worth their while to, to, to pay them on the back, uh, back part. So um, go find the talent you need, make them an offer they can't refuse. Or That's great. Yenvi, Terry Ann? So I, I will just add to that, or what if you're in the position where you're trying to figure out, do I take this business that I've been doing as a side hustle and now making it my full-time uh, effort into a business? Um, I'm going to say, still take a look at those key performance indicators that lets you know that it's time to make that conversion, right? Um, if you are um, putting in your, your uh, if you're getting your customers, if you're getting your monthly recurring revenue, if you're hitting those metrics that lets you know that you are ready to, to do that conversion, um, whether you're in a recession or not, whether you're going out there and getting the additional training, like attending these type of seminars or going to scale up or BCX, any type of accelerator incubator, um, and it tells you that you are getting that regular recurring revenue, you're able to pay yourself, uh, you could be your first hire, you never know. Right. Uh, there's another question from Winsome Williams about, is there a process to register as a black woman or minority business? Um, I know a little bit about this because I'm registered as a Florida MBE, Minority Business Enterprise, um, there are a, a couple different organizations that you'll need to go through. There's the FSMSDC, Florida State Minority Supplier Diversity Council, and they have guide, people who can guide you in that. Interestingly, I don't qualify as Hispanic uh, according to the FSMSDC because my father's from Spain, but I do qualify as Hispanic uh, as a, by the Florida State government. So there's a separate certification that I was able to get as an MBE through them. Uh, Yenvi, Terry Ann, uh, Nadej, do you guys know about the women-owned uh, certifications? I'm not familiar. Yes, yes, we are. I am familiar with them. So how do you go about uh, certifying yourself as a woman-owned business, WBE? Uh, there's a women-owned, there's a minority-owned. Um, you can work through the process I did uh, with the Broward County office, um, small business office, where they can take you through uh, what the full process entails. But it's women, there's women owned and there's a minority, minority owned as well. And probably the single best resource for all of this is Strive 305 and Danilo at the mayor's office, because he's in touch with all of those organizations. You know, that's Miami-Dade County, but a lot of those go across county. So um, Danilo, if you could put your contact info in the chat, uh, that's probably the place to start. Uh, honestly, uh, Winsome, that's the purpose of this Drive 305 is to connect you to those resources. Um, boy, uh, Ait Zarellis Negron asked, my business is focused on financial literacy. Do you have any advice on, our, uh, on, a, on how our new business could build institutional clients, schools, et cetera, as well as individual clients? So what I think she's asking is, I run a business that focuses on financial literacy I want to get clients that are more like government, 
uh, or B2B, like larger organizations, in addition to individual financial literacy coaching. Um, Yenvi, any advice you might give to Ait Zarellis? Start off small, execute small, prove that, uh, you know, it's all about the numbers in business and you should know that with financials, right? So um, meaning that what, what are your outcomes and results? You, you know, did you prove that you, the your program um, increased someone's literacy and gave them great results? Right. And now how do we scale that? Because once we go into an institutional level, especially government, there's different layers of how you um, navigate through the system in order to get to the right person within the institutional or a larger scale um, offering. And so but but it always goes back to what are your results and, and proving. So if you have a program with a thousand individuals with great results, great data, and then taking that and maybe a case study or something like that or white paper, and then taking that and bring it at an institutional level, then they're able to say, okay, let's try a pilot. Let's, um, let's do a beta and we'll pick a population and we can explore this with, with that population. So it really, you wanna execute, have results, have outcomes, and then take it step by step. Um, and then once you get one large institute and prove great outcomes and results with that large institute, then you can scale it from institute to institute. That's great. So I'm going to launch the poll now, inviting folks to kind of opt in to giving your contact information to the Venture Mentoring Team, BCEX, the Broward College Entrepreneurial Experience, and Scale Up at the Idea Center. Uh, when you registered, you gave us your contact info, and so you can click on all those boxes, and that gives us permission to share your contact info with each of those programs. We're going to now talk about what each of those programs are, um, what, you'll, what they cover, how to apply, what the cost is, if there's a cost, um, and before we get to that, I just want to like nerd out for a sec. So I, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would become the biggest business operations and strategy nerd on planet Earth, I would have told you were, I would call you a scoundrel and a liar. But yet here is my stack of strategy books that I love and adore and that were the inspiration of today's and this whole masterclass session. And I'm gonna quickly walk you through these um, and then I will uh, invite the panels to talk. But I feel like this is the best chance I'm going to get to nerd it out uh, on strategy with you guys. The, the reason why I've gotten so nerdy about strategy is because I've run a very messy business for a number of years. And it's only in the last year or two where I've started to get a handle on things and my life has improved. And so now I'm just hungry for more. Uh, more strategy and more better processes. So that my journey started out, of course, with the Lean Startup. Um, I have not actually found this book terribly useful to me because of the kind of business I run, which is a me too business, as they say, and that's more for a scaled startup. But the principles of agile have become incredibly important. Another really inspirational book from my corporate days was Good to Great by Jim Collins. A lot of great insights in here. Some of them have been debunked, uh, it turns out. But I still think there's like the BHAG concept, the big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, really phenomenal. Now, there are a couple granddaddies of strategy. The Probably the single most inspirational book I ever read was Built to Sell by John Warlow. Uh, this is a really short book. It's a story-based book. And honestly, it's a little bit of like an entrepreneurial fantasy of how to go from a business where it runs you to a business that you run and that you can sell. And it talks specifically about how to take a service-based business and productize the service. Uh, in this case, it's an agency that sells marketing services. They then become experts at building websites. And they're actually able to charge more. It's easier to market. And the guy ends up selling the company for a ton of money. This is the granddad. Well, actually, this, the e-myth, is like the granddaddy of small business books. Uh, and um, 
you know, this is actually the follow-up. I realize I don't have the E-Myth Revisited, which is the first one. But Michael Gerber, like, really introduced a framework and language for small business. You know, some of you may not realize this, but small businesses represent the majority of business in the United States. And they also are the least talked about and least supported uh, outside of government. Uh, all the intention seems to go to startups, venture-backed startups, and how to scale and build a startup. Um, and and then the corporate uh, kind of insights and, and a lot of attention like in, in books like Jim Collins about how corporations uh, are great and then decline. And so the E-Myth, uh, Michael Gerber was like one of the first people to really take seriously this third category of business, not the venture back startup, not the big uh, Fortune 500 company, but the everybody in between, um, the Me Too businesses, the bakeries and the training academies of the world. And he created something called the E-Myth Revisited. He talked about how most of us are technicians, right? Like most people, like I guarantee you, Nadej's, I know, actually, I know this for a fact, Nadej's family, right, are bakers of bread, right, bakers. That's why they started a bakery. I am a teacher. That's why I started an academy. Nadej, she's an entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman. Like she's coming to this, not as a baker with a special recipe, but as a businesswoman who's worked at PepsiCo. And that's why she's succeeding because she's taking an entrepreneurial mindset to it. That's what the E-Myth is about. And then Vern Harnish basically built that up. He started with this book called The Mastering of the Rockefeller Habits. And there's this great, if you search Rockefeller Habits, there's this great checklist. And then he built it out on scaling up. And the curriculum of the entrepreneurs organization that I'm a part of uses scaling up. But then there was the most recent entrant, 10 years old, and it's taken the business world by storm, which is what we're going to focus on in next session, which is traction in EOS. And let's be honest, it's just this is a this is a simplification of this. Um, it, it basically took and renamed and cut out a lot of excess stuff and made it a lot simpler. And, you know, some people might say, oh, they just kind of ripped off the ideas that Vern Harnish came up. I actually think the act of simplifying and clarifying is incredibly important. Why? Because that's what I do for marketing. So I really salute Gina Wick Wickman and the, the, the EOS folks. And there's a reason it's been so successful. And then finally, little shout out uh, to Mike O'Donnell. I asked him, you know, Mike, I eventually want to sell this business. What book should I read? Early Exits by Basil Peters. Uh, I got to be honest, hard to read. I have had a lot of trouble getting through this. It's like on my bookshelf. I'm not quite there business-wise to get there, but it's on my bookshelf. Like I a lot of times buy books that I know I'm going to need to read later. So Early Exits is one. I, you know, since we're, we're talking about it, The Art of Selling Your Business was the follow-up book by John Warlow. He also has a podcast about selling your business. This is way more, uh, probably a little less useful than this, but way more inspiring. And then uh, the book that really got me super excited was Gina Wickman's book called Get a Grip, which talks about the visionary CEO and the operations-minded integrator. And these are terms that they invented. Um, they're basically like, there's the visionary CEO and he's out like having crazy ideas and getting distracted by bright, shiny objects. And there's the person who actually executes. And that's the integrator. I actually believe, uh, you know, this is my own personal opinion. And we'll see what um, Liz says next week when I talk about this. I actually think that traction was invented by operational people, by integrators to put CEO, visionary CEOs in a box put them into the corner of the business and get them out of the way. I really think that that's what is actually happening in there. And, you know, God bless them. Like I need to get out of my own way, out of the way of my business. So that's Dan Gretsch on strategy. It took me basically 10 years of study to come up with that book of li list of books. Uh, we'll include as a follow-up to this, a handout with those list of books. And if there's any other books that anybody loves, uh, whether a panelist uh, or someone who's on the chat, Feel free to throw it in the chat. We'll include it on the list as well. So with that, um, I want to now open it up to uh, the kind of resource sharing. Um, and I'll start actually with Terry ann uh, to talk about the Venture Mentoring Team. Thank you. 
Uh, so the Venture Mentoring Team is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, founded in 2017 with a dual purpose. Uh, we train and certify mentors who are all volunteers, and their goal is to help startups and small businesses succeed and get to the next stage of growth. Um, so if and we work with uh, any business from idea stage to those that have already launched, um, whether they're ready for their first round of investment or if they just need um, to meet with a group of mentors and, and kick their idea around and get some feedback in a session that we call a pitch scrub, uh, where if you've got your pitch deck and you really want to test it against some really savvy uh, mentors like Mike O'Donnell and, and Yenvi and, and see how well it sticks, um, your idea sticks. Uh, and so it's in a unique format uh, with that team mentoring approach. We look for about three to five mentors um, who volunteer to want to wanna meet with companies. And the application process is all online. I'll, I'll put that into the chat uh, later. It's just on our website. And we ask for you to submit a 60 second video that just tells us a little bit about you. And from there, uh, our database uh, is presented with your profile and the mentors that volunteer schedule your first session. And one of the great things about the VMT is you're not limited to a certain amount of sessions. It's all about the relationship building. Um, so we do encourage you to continue to meet with your mentors on a monthly basis um, and set those goals. I mentioned it before, it is self-care for your business. Um, so it gives you that opportunity to, to meet um, as you need and work on goals and uh, definitely scale your business. And I'd love for Nadej to weigh in here. Uh, I'm the beneficiary of VMT mentorship for more than five years, but I know Nadej, you were as well. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how you benefited from the VMT? Thank you for the time. Um, well, as a, as a mentee for the last... I would say a little over a year, right, Tarian? Um, the VMT really helped me, um, especially through the bulk of the pandemic and with inflation and with rising prices, just to look at the business with a critical eye in terms of margins, in terms of planning, um, innovation that we can do with our um, operational processes. And so I would say it's just a safe space of mentors, people who have been through where I have been through or has scaled the business that can really be thoughtful partners um, to challenge me on how I can innovate and how I can um, create unlocks within the company. And so I really appreciate the, the mentors. Uh, they are seasoned, but they are always available um, whenever you need them. And they leverage their networks with their mentees as well. So you, you not only get access to three to five mentors, you get access to their networks, you get access to their time, which is very valuable. Um, so really thank you, Terry Ann, and thank you to everyone in DMT. You're welcome. Wonderful. Um, next, Yen V, you wanna sh t tell us a little bit about scale up at the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College? First, I, I'm also a beneficiary of, of VMT. So um, I, I was mentored there. And then I'm um, after my experience, I, I joined the VMT as a mentor as well. And so it's it's a it's a very, very good program for anyone that's that that needs that personal guidance, um, you know, and and have questions, specific questions to ask. Um, but going in, into Miami Dade um, College's Idea Center is uh, I'm the lead instructor, and, and the goal is you know very focused on the the community businesses, the small businesses of our our tri county community. We've had people from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, you know, um, Broward, West Palm come down. Uh, for the program. And we've, uh, in the past couple of years, we've been doing it hybrid, um, except for the year of COVID. Um, but the last session was uh, was um, hybrid, virtual, and, and on site. Next cohort, I, I believe it's early next, uh, first quarter of next year, we should be more on site with some virtual. Um, but again, we, we focus on the cohesion um, there's about 12 weeks, it's a 12 weeks program, 12 to 15 week program where you're learning from, from marketing to sales to value proposition, uh, product market fit, and um, 
And it's really understanding the fundamentals of a business. We, we do a lot of assumptions as business owners and we try to go with our gut or we do an internet search and we ask around, but there's a, everything in a business is a cog that works together, right? From marketing to sales, to operations, to bringing that customer back to returning. And so everything is a cog in a system. And that's our goal is to make sure that you understand every cog that works together so that the system is working smoothly. And so um, Dan is, is a specialized instructor in marketing. We have specialized instructors in financials and in a value proposition, um, in building teams and operations and sales and marketing. So all these pieces are pieces of a business that you won't lack. Um, and so, so it's a, it's a very good program. We have a great community. The community still exists after, uh, the, the students graduate, uh, they all work together and they work with each other as well. Um, and so, uh, if, if anything, walking away after the program, you have a great community of other business owners that you can relate to and are at the same level as you. And we root each other on in that community. So. Wonderful. Is there anything else at the Idea Center programming wise that you're aware of that people should be maybe looking at or thinking about? Yeah, I would say go go to the site. There's a ton of programs, and and the great thing about uh, the programs at the Idea Center is that they're sponsored as well. So you can apply for a grant or a scholarship, um, and and have um, part of your tuition. Um, paid through a scholarship um, by like TD Bank, for example, and there's there's a ton of them. It's it's, it's amazing uh, the the resources that's out there to, to support our our um, our entrepreneurs and business owners in, in South Florida. Love it. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you also to share uh, after Mike presents one addition, one or two additional resources that are your favorites in town for other places. So I'm just giving you a heads up so you can think about it. Uh, Mike O'Donnell, tell us about BCEX, my personal favorite. Uh, sure. So it's the Broward College Entrepreneurial Experience. Think of it as a combination of an accelerator that moves you into actually building a company. It's a mix of people who already have a small business and those who just really have an idea for one. So it, it, it's a combination. It's six months. Most accelerators are 10, 12 weeks. I also mentored for the Founder Institute. That's 16 weeks. Um, so BCEX is six months, fairly rigorous. Um, and it happens in three phases. Phase one is sort of a boot camp that sort of gets you grounded. And are you really ready to do this? And there's an application process to see if it passes the smell test and not just tire kickers. Um, then you go into Terry's phase. That's really the lean launch pad, lean startup. He's probably the best instructor I've ever seen, uh, that teaches the lean startup methodology. He's also a BMT mentor. Um, he's just excellent at it. Um, I, I, I couldn't do it justice like, like he does. Um, but it, that's, I think, um, 13 weeks, Terry, you put it in the chat, correct me if I'm wrong, 12 to 13 weeks. And he puts you through the gauntlet, um, I actually invited Terry with us. Terry, are you there? I am, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. You're getting a lot of praise from Mike. I just wanted to give you a chance to weigh in as well. Well, you know, I gave him, uh, what, $5,000, Mike? You know, and, and <laughs> I'm, getting my, I'm getting my feedback. I'm getting my, my worth out of that one. Well, well, tell him about your phase, Terry. Yeah, sure. The, the middle phase, uh, the, the first phase is ideation. That's where people who come in and and have no idea what their what their idea is, or only have a ghost of an idea. Uh, they spend six or eight weeks working together with teams to figure out what that idea is and try and coalesce it into something that's worth um, uh, working on together. Uh, the second phase that I'm in is varies between ten and thirteen weeks, depending on the specifics of what we're doing. That is detailed lean launchpad. It's a lot of work. We are extremely, deliberately, extremely demanding uh, about uh, the people that join the course. Um, and, and I hate to say it this way, but we're kind of proud of the fact that uh, if 20 join, 15 make it through. Uh, and that's simply to underscore that it's a lot of hard work uh, to create what you have to create to go through that course and, and get your feet on the ground as a business person. The third phase is Mike's and Mike takes all the grounding that we've done, all the details we've done, 
the pitch deck you put together and the business plan you put together in my face, and then um, uh, takes it to, to the level of uh, strategy and design and how do you actually get things done uh, as, you're, as you're trying to turn to change your business from a good idea to a moneymaker. Uh, so I've been working on this and Mike have been working on this and it's precursor for uh, eight years, Mike, something like that. 2013. It's, it's 2013 was the first one. Startup, startup quest and startup. Oh my now. God, 13. <laughs> um, okay, and and that time uh, we've graduated a lot of people that have um, taken their what was a, just a concept at the beginning and are uh, running with a business at the end. Terry, you might want to mention the fund because if the, if you make it through, you have an opportunity to pitch to the uh, angel fund. That's right. If you when you make it through the course, um, and that's all three phases, then we give you a couple of months out in the real world where we want to see if you actually start your idea and actually try and get some traction on it to get really running with it, and then at some point everybody comes back and people pitch to the Armstrong Fund, which is a um, which is a, uh, a venture fund run by uh, Broward College, and there are grants from that fund that that assist startups in getting uh, their business rolling. So it's really from your first dream of concept all the way out to raising capital, and and uh, it it is a a real um, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of gain from taking taking the effort and running with it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, and uh, Mike, uh, is there, um, if, if you could just put in the chat or Terry, uh, how people can learn more about and apply for VCEX. Uh, I see you also listed the Broward Adventures Fund. If there's a link to that as well, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about Strive 305, which is Danilo's program. Um, Strive 305, and, and, and um, Tiffany, if you could put the link in there. Um, Strive 305 is kind of a clearinghouse of resources uh, that the county is putting together uh, as sort of your one-stop shop for all of this information. One of the things that he does is he funds this masterclass series. He also has a Friday morning huddle. They call it the, the morning huddle, where he shares resources. A lot of those resources uh, are specifically geared for underserved businesses because he is out of the diversity and inclusion department of Miami Dade College, uh, Miami Dade uh, Office of the Mayor. So um, they're a great sort of clearinghouse. So now I'm going to invite uh, each of you, uh, including you, uh, Nadej, to in, uh, tell me your other favorite resource for small businesses in town. And then I'm gonna go back through each of you and ask for your favorite business strategy book, and then we'll wrap up. So first I'll ask you, who's your favorite resource not that's not been mentioned uh, for small business support and development? And then second is what, what is your favorite strategy book that hasn't been mentioned yet? Uh, to get, make it easy, I'll start with you, Nadej. What is your favorite business support organization that we haven't mentioned yet? Um, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, but the Urban League um, is, is a great resource and has been a great resource to me. They've partnered with other companies and, and even uh, I believe VMT as well in the past uh, to really provide resources and create an environment um, where people can get additional information and network and things of that nature. So definitely lean into the Urban League as appropriate. Great recommendation. Uh, let's see, whoever goes last, I'm picking on. So uh, I'm going to pick on you, Mike. Sorry. So Yenvi, what's your favorite resource? I would have to say um, the BMT, <laughs> hands down. That's why I, I, I volunteered. And, 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 and Miami Dade Ideas Center. <laughs> all right. The Idea Center. <laughs> I'm, I'm in both. I'm in both. We're all in both. But I would say, you know, um it's different yeah um, you, broke, you broke the rules all right you better come up with a really good book idea uh terry ann <laughs> this is super hard because i work with so many of the community partners and you're forcing me to pick one well you can actually give i'll give you yenvi's given that she already mentioned okay. one we heard from um okay so if i have to pick two um 
Startup FIU is a great one, uh, just because they also have a small business component and a startup component. And uh, if just in case you didn't know this, they've got a great partnership with the Collaboratory for Inclusive Entrepreneurship at University of Florida. Um, so they actually take entrepreneurs through all stages. Um, edit is a idea stage to launch stage, and then they've got a similar to scale up for people that have already launched. And then they have a CEO program as well for folks that are at their series A or later program. So if you look up the collaborate, and I'll post that in the chat, Collaboratory for Inclusive Entrepreneurship, it's a partnership between University of Florida and Startup FIU. So I really love that program. That's a good one. Yeah. Do I still have to do another one? Oh, that was your first? I thought there were two there because Startup FIU is the other. Oh, okay, yeah. And then another one is the Levan Center because they also do like full cycle idea stage, incubate stage, and then accelerate stage as well. But I love I love all the community partners, BC, BCEX. Um, I'm a big fan of all of them. Nice. All right, last but not least, Mike. Hey, well, I don't have a favorite it, and they all, they all serve different purposes, different stages, different types of entrepreneurs, but the two I'll mention are Fowler Institute. I've mentored for FI for more than 11 years and chapters all over the world. Actually, I helped bring FI to South Florida. Um, and I just mentored for South Africa, for example. So they have a great program. And one that is often um, overlooked and underrated is SCORE, especially if you're in that red ocean. Um, SCORE has some very good mentors and it's a, it's a lot different than it used to be five, 10 years ago. So it's a service core of retired executives. It's a program of the SBA. Um, and so if you just need, you need a mentor to talk to every week and, and really get into the nitty gritty of your business, SCORE is uh, a good resource. Excellent. Um, I listed a couple more, uh, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, the Jim Moran Institute, Miami Bayside Foundation, the SBDC at FIU, uh, Startup City. And I think we also have a local branch of 100 startups, I think, as well, uh, I think. So anyway, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, what I have generally found is that the government funded ones tend to be in support of small businesses. Uh, there's also, you know, we mentioned them, the FSMSDC, uh, who's specific, but they do a lot of free programming. Um, the the ones that are like privately funded tend to be more venture back startup uh, based. But, and, and you know, depending on what your goals are and where you are, there's definitely stuff to learn from each. But depending, I would really focus on a program that really aims to serve businesses like yours. Um, so now uh, we'll go in reverse order on favorite business strategy book before we wrap up. So Mike O'Donnell, what is your favorite business strategy book that has not yet been mentioned? I know I took a lot of the favorites. Uh, I would encourage you to look at Trajectory by Dave Parker. Uh, Dave's a good friend of mine. He's a venture capitalist. He's started and grown a couple of businesses and he focuses on how to get that traction, how to get the right trajectory. And he probably has the best discussion of business models in any book I've ever read. It really helped them. Entrepreneurs struggle with their business model. What, what model should they um, should they go after? Or they try to do too many models at the same time. And he, he goes through a very thorough discussion on all the trade-offs of the various business models you can choose, and then how to get traction and how, how to get your company on the right trajectory. So trajectory by Dave Parker. Love it. Um, I forgot my order, but I think Terry Ann, you're next. Um, so I love, oh, you can't see it. It's called The First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. Um, it's a great book that talks about what there's skills that get you there, but then what's going to take you there to the next level. Um, so I usually have two copies of the book because I love to give it as a gift typically. Um, so it all it's all about developing that emotional intelligence, that EQ skills. Yeah, the, the, the biggest thing about the first 90 days, I read that book when I took over as news director at WLRN. I didn't follow this advice, but they basically say, don't make changes in the first 90 days. Watch, listen, understand. Because I didn't follow that advice, I suffered for years afterwards for the consequences of d making good decisions, but too quickly. Uh, Yenvi, I'm excited. What is your favorite mm -hmm. book? favorite book and and I only recommend things that I use <laughs> so so the one thing by Gary Keller 
Um, it's thinking about what, understanding what to focus on in your business or even in your life um, and knowing that there's a big domino effect to it. And so what's that big domino that you tilt over that allows it to topple over the other things? And so thinking critically about what to focus on that will really go downstream and affect all the other pieces of, of your business or your life. Love it. And can you also mention the uh, red ocean, blue ocean strategy book? Because I know that it's called Blue Ocean Strategy is the book. And um, the the author is uh, Chan Kim. And um, I think it's Renee uh, Mabarjani or so. It's hard to, but just Blue Ocean Strategy is the name of the book. With, yeah. Uh, and, and thank you for, I didn't know about that one, but I read up on it and I really like it and I'm following it. Uh, and all right, Nadej, I know you're a reader and student of all this stuff. Uh, we'll let you close this out. What is your favorite strategy book? So the first 90 days was on my list as well, <laughs> I will say. Um, but, but even taking a step back, because I actually used to be a psych major at FSU before sh shifting to business. And I like to really get to understand the consumer, consumer behaviors. So I like to take a step back and books like you know, how to win friends and influence people by Carnegie is something you have to have not all not only on your 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 bookshelf, but you have to read it. <laughs> you have to read it. Um, and then another good book to, to me is The Power of Habit, why we do what we do in life and in business, because as a small business owner, as an entrepreneur, you know how things, life versus business, it's not separate. <laughs> Sometimes you try to separate it, um, but it's always good to take a step back and have a bigger picture and a vision and good habits um, to make sure that everything is going in the right direction. And so those are the two books that I would move forward, but I also love the, the first 90 days. I love it. So if you weren't able to take the notes at home, Part of the follow-up we're going to do is a thank you gift for being here today is we'll give you that full list of recommended books. Uh, and with that, thank you guys for being part of an amazing session one of this masterclass series. One week from today, we're going to talk about traction and EOS. Um, I did misspeak. The book I was describing uh, was not Get a Grip. It was Rocket Fuel. This is the one about the visionary um, uh, integrator relationship. The book Get a Grip is more a description of a company utilizing EOS. There are seven books uh, in the EOS library. Um, and um, one of my favorites is called What the Heck is EOS? And that's a really good book for your staff uh, if you want to just give them kind of a high level summary of it. So with that, thank you again to the mayor's office. Thanks to the VMT. Thank you guys, uh, Nadej, Mike, Yenvi, and Terry Ann, uh, and Terry Bentley for coming today and sharing your expertise in these great resources. Um, just uh, get ready, guys. As I said, winter is coming, but we're here to give you an overcoat so you're ready for the cold. Take care, everybody.